I've got a graph up here to show you all to start with. And I actually use this graph a lot, both in growing calf and in mature cow presentations. And what we've done is across the bottom, the x-axis, we've got months of the year, so October through March. And then across the y-axis is the total digestible nutrient concentration in the diet. Now you'll notice that green dashed line. I want to point out something very specific to you about that line. That line represents the energy requirement for a lactating mature cow that is at peak lactation. So this would be for a fall calving cow who's fixing to go into the breeding season. That's going to be the TDN concentration that we need in the diet to meet her nutrient requirements. Interestingly enough, though, that line also represents the TDN requirement in the diet to get a growing calf to gain about 1.5 pounds per day. And so it kind of means two things. It means a moderate level of growth for a young calf. It means meeting maintenance energy requirements for a mature cow that's at peak lactation. And so let's put some of our feed options into context with it. I have long been a proponent of everybody that can fertilize in August and stockpile some fescue. That is our competitive advantage in Missouri with tall fescue being our primary forage base. The quality of the tall fescue, especially early in the fall and into the early part of winter, quality from an energy standpoint is just quite frankly unparalleled relative to other forage resources. Now, certainly the big limitation in stockpile fescue, though, is, is not so much quality as it is quantity in a lot of respects. Where we've had a, a dry fall, we may not have gotten the same growth that we would have in a more normal precipitation regime. The um, next one to, to think about here as we go through this is hay. Okay, and so you know, we're, we've got a lot of folks that are already feeding hay due to the lack of fall growth that we got in our pastures, the drought conditions. I've listed hay here as 55 TDN. Now, understand that this hay would represent what I would say is average to average plus fescue hay. And so, you know, it, it would not be all that uncommon to find fescue hay that will test 50 TDN or even into the high 40s in a lot of cases. And, and while you could see some fescue hay test above 60 TDN, it's rarely going to break 60, even a fescue clover mix that was cut at the ideal time. And so I'd sort of chosen average here, but it's important to note that, you know, especially for adequate growth in growing calves and for mature cows at their peak nutrient requirements, you know, hay that tests a 55% TDN, that, that gap between the two lines is going to represent a nutrient deficiency that we have to fill with some supplement. Now, where do the commodity blends fit into this? The commodity blends are, are very nutrient dense, energy dense in particular feedstuffs. As you'll notice, I've got a grain mix here. Now, the grain mix that I used to formulate this line was a third cracked corn, a third distiller's grains, and a third soy hull pellets. So a very common thirds mix commodity blend that we would see here in Missouri with a TDN concentration of 80. And so that commodity mix is a, it's a great way to sort of bend the curve for some lower quality hay and put that extra energy in specifically into the diets where we might need it. Just to kind of summarize or reiterate the points I made here across these last few slides, fescue hay's got a pretty low ceiling in terms of energy concentration. And the two scenarios that we need to be cognizant of and potentially thinking about, you know, a supplementation strategy is if we don't have stockpile to graze or we're feeding low quality hay. And especially even if your hay was put up at the appropriate time, it was cut well, if you've left it to store out on the ground exposed to the elements, so out in the fence row, something along those lines, you know, it, it's fair to say that there's been some leaching of nutrients, even if it was net wrapped during the four to six months that it's been stored. So that would be conditions where perhaps we would have some of that energy lacking and need to fill those gaps. Okay, so now this slide, I've got two commodity mixes that I pulled the feed tags off the internet. And I kind of want to talk you through them just so you understand what they are. Remember, due to AFCO rules, the feed labels have to carry uh, concentrations of crude protein, crude fat, fiber, and then any minerals that are provided as well. Now, the AFCO regulations, rather than listing the individual ingredients used in each commodity mix, they put them in these bins. 
So you'll notice ingredients for the commodity mix on the left say grain products, processed grain byproducts. And then the one on the right has grain products, processed grain byproducts and roughage products. Okay, and so grain products would be corn, milo, barley, wheat, the, the actual cereal grains themselves, okay? The next one, the processed grain byproducts, that would represent any high protein, either oil seed meals or quite frankly, byproducts of the ethanol process. So, you know, in, in this case, the processed grain byproducts are more than likely either distiller's grains or gluten pellets. And then the third one, roughage products. If you see roughage products on a feed tag, that more than likely represents hulls of some kind. Now, given that Missouri is a top three or top five state in the country in terms of soybean production, the primary roughage product that we're going to see in these commodity blends like this are going to be soybean hulls, okay? Still, one of the big issues that we have is that there's no measurement of energy, but there is a relationship between crude fiber and energy. The lower the crude fiber, more than likely the greater the energy concentration is going to be in this feed. Now, based on what I'm seeing in terms of ingredients, I suspect that you know, these are going to be relatively close to what I showed you on the previous slide in terms of an ADTDN feed stuff. And if you'll notice in terms of crude protein concentration at 12, these are more designed to be a complement to a forage, a low quality forage to bring up the energy concentration in the diet. They're not intended to be a high protein supplement to enhance the intake and utilization of low quality forages. These are more for a situation where we know the hay is not gonna meet nutrient requirements even after protein has been met. We're still gonna be energy deficient. And notice that they're also, they're specifically the feeding directions say to feed, you know, at a rate of anywhere between three and four pounds ahead a day or one to 2% of body weight. And the, the second label says specifically that they have adequate pasture or roughage available. And so the intention of these products was to accent and not to replace. You need to be really careful. These aren't intended to be fed in place of low quality forages. So how would I use these two products examples here specifically? I would use them as an energy supplement and I may or may not follow their instructions. What I would do with growing calves is I would encourage you if you're using a commodity mix when you're weaning calves, you've got some free choice hay out or they're out on pasture to keep the energy concentration up in their diet, to keep them gaining at a pound and a half to two pounds a day, I would feed a minimum of 1% of body weight per day. So for a 500 pound calf, that's going to be about five pounds a day. That's a little more than the recommendations of the tag on the left, but right in line with the ones on the right. And I, I think it's fair to feed him somewhere in the range of one to 2% of body weight because calves that size are going to eat somewhere in the neighborhood of about 3% of their body weight per day in feed. And so if we, we feed them 2% of their body weight a day in this commodity pellet, we're going to get some aggressive high two, low three pound gains, but we're also still gonna be keeping the diet that's about a third to 40% roughage. And so, you know, you're, you shouldn't run into any digestive upset issues in that case. Now for lactating cows, if you're only feeding your cows two or three pounds of feed a day, really what you're doing is training them to come to a feed bucket. You're probably not moving the needle in terms of changing the, the number of calories that they're consuming in a day. If you're gonna feed these, you probably need to feed more five, six pounds a day, at least, you know, somewhere. And now 1% of body weight for a mature cow, you know, that might be 12, 14 pounds. That certainly could be excessive, but I would encourage you to at least consider feeding them, you know, four or five, six pounds a day, really trying to, to bring a little more energy into the diet and, and to use them as a, as a forage complement, not a replacement. And just keep in mind to remember that this is an energy supplement. This is not a protein supplement. If you think protein is low, just go back to the 7911 rule that I've talked about before. So a spring calving cow who has a calf weaned off of her who is currently dry, you know, her crude protein requirement is in the neighborhood of 7%. A last trimester of gestation cow, her crude protein requirement is in the 9% range. And then a lactating cow, her crude protein requirement is in the 11% range. And so that's the rule of thumb you use to know what your hay test or and your forage test might, the crude protein on it compared to what the cows actually need is. And then if you're building calf rations, you want to make sure that those calves have a diet that has at least 12 and a half percent protein. And, and, 
you know, quite frankly, being a little long there, I, I don't think is going to hurt you any. How would stockpiled fescues drop in TDN compared to corn stocks in the January, March timeframe? To me, the stockpile tall fescue and the corn stocks are two completely different classes of feeds. The stockpile fescue is going to be much greater in TDN at all time points relative to the corn stocks. The corn stocks would fit into a spring calving cow who is in mid gestation. The corn stocks will meet those cows nutrient requirements very well, but in terms of fleshing up cows, in terms of growing calves, you know, the, the ceiling of the energy available in the corn stocks is going to be pretty limited. And, and here's why. And so a cow that's turned out onto a fresh field of corn stalks has access potentially to any drop grain, to any leaf, husk, cob, and stock. Now the drop grain, the leaf, and the husk are relatively high quality feeds. The cob and the stock are very poor feeds. When we turn them out, we typically will tell people that you'll get about a month grazing for every cow that you turn out per acre. And in that case, Essentially, the goodie's going to be on the front end, and if you try to drag that out longer, you know, the TDN concentration of their diet is going to drop precipitously. Now, if you're turning them out onto new stocks periodically over the winter, you should be able to maintain a diet that's going to be in the high 50s to around 60 TDN as long as you keep going to new stocks. But if the cows continuously graze the same field, your TDN is going to start out high, and quite frankly, once they get to where they're eating cob and stock, it's going to fall off a cliff. So lower class of feed than the stockpile tall fescue, but quite frankly, still, if managed properly, is probably going to be a greater quality energy density feed than some mismanaged fescue hay, quite frankly.